Order, order. It's time for the questions to the Executive Office, and we start with a list of questions. I call Alex Easton. Well, Mr. Speaker. And with your permission, I will answer questions 1 and 10 together. Um, priorities from the last mandate remain important to us, and we will bring forward the Ending Violence Against Women and Girls Strategic Framework and press ahead with the important programme of work in relation to mother and baby institutions, Magdalene laundries and workhouses. These are crucially important issues, but set against the backdrop of a very difficult financial position. The Executive's most immediate priority is the stabilisation of public finances, and we're in ongoing communication with Treasury and with the Prime Minister, and are calling for public finances to be placed on a sustainable footing. We're in the process of developing and agreeing an immediate set of priorities for the Executive, and we will, of course, update the Assembly in due course. Ms. Racy. Thank you. Could I thank the First Minister for her answer? What is the Executive Office's assessment of what Northern Ireland revenue raising is required to meet those targets, and what does it mean for the Central Good Relation Fund? First Minister. Yes, thank you again. Um, I think that there is no doubt uh, what I said in terms of our priorities. Of we work towards our programme for government and our uh, immediate priorities, um, of which there are many to deal with. It is important that we get the basics right in terms of the fiscal framework, so that is why we have identified that, and I am very delighted that we enjoy cross-party support in terms of making the case for a proper uh, financial arrangement here. That is an ongoing piece of work, um, and that will obviously have implications in terms of how we fund all the different programmes that we have, whether that is within the Executive Office or across all the other um, departments. So uh, I have no doubt that over the course of time we will have much more to say to the member in terms of what that actual budget looks like, um, particularly as we develop um, next year's budget. Call Jerry Kelly. I go and us a lesson pre -viral. I thank the First Minister for that answer. First Minister for answer up to now. Um, in terms of laying out the priorities, um, can I ask what impact uh, the Tory austerity, at least the continuation of the Tory austerity, uh, has on those priorities? First Minister. Thank you. And, and again, um, I mean, there's no escaping the fact that Tory austerity has badly damaged our public services and. The executive has clearly outlined serious concerns with our current financial situation. We are funded below need, um, but as I said, I'm glad that all ministers are united and speak with one voice on the fact that we need to be um, properly funded here. The executive has written to the government and the Treasury and are calling for a discussion on a long-term um, fund and stability plan. And that needs to be urgent and it needs to be an ongoing discussion that we need to have with Treasury because it's critical that we are given the right resources so that we can put our finances on a more um, stable footing. Um, we have to get this fundamental right. Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Speaker, um, First Minister, could you please outline the timeline for the recruitment of a permanent secretary to the Executive Office? Thank you. Uh, I don't have the detail in terms of um, that process, but it is underway. Um, but I'm very happy to confirm in writing to the Chair of the new co committee uh, and wish you well in, in your role. Um, but certainly, we'll, we'll write that out to you. Paul Fruit. If the First Minister is truly a First Minister for all, will she meet with the COVID-19 vaccine injured and bereaved? First Minister. Thank you. Um, I am very happy to meet with anybody who writes in and requests a meeting. I think it's important that even whenever we agree or disagree on things that we're able to have the conversations. Uh, thank you. Um, First Minister, could you just outline uh, your proposals for the setting up of a transformation delivery unit? Minister. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is something that is still um, in development. We are working our way through um, the detail of that, but I think it is very important that and I think it is your own um, colleague that actually had raised some concerns that it is open to all ministers and everybody has an access to it. So That is something that is under policy development, but again, we will have an opportunity to come back and talk, and the, the House here itself will have a chance to scrutinise what is being proposed. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. First Minister, um, notwithstanding the current debate uh, and discussions around the fiscal package, uh, executive parties have been in discussions around developing a programme for government, I think, for around 18 months now, in a parallel process to other talks. Can you give us a date for when the programme for government will be published? Well, I can assure you that um, it is just in the last two weeks that we are now formally around the table discussing a programme for government, and we will bring that forward as quickly as possible, and again for scrutiny um, in this Assembly chamber. Previous to the restoration of the executive, there were numerous conversations in terms of, with the head of the civil service around um, priorities, what that potentially could look like. But that is not a substitute for an official programme for government, which we are currently working our way through. So I hope 
in the coming weeks to be able to come back and talk in the chamber about that at length. Well, Jim Allister, next question. Okay. Sure. As First and Deputy First Ministers, we have taken the pledge of office required of all ministers, and in this pledge we have agreed to observe the joint nature of the office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and to support and act in accordance with all decisions of the Executive Committee and Assembly. We are fully committed to delivering on this pledge in all aspects of our public duties. Mr Allister. Well, let me make the follow-up question very clear. When the First Minister flies at public expense to, say, the St Patrick's Day celebrations in Washington, will she exploit the fact she is travelling at public expense, and will she abuse the office that she holds by espousing causes such as the Palestinian cause or the cause of Irish unity, because those are hardly executive agreed policies, or are they? First Minister. Thank you. When arrangements are made for official travel, these are always within the context of the joint nature of our office. Speaking personally, I believe that it is uh, incumbent upon all of us to use every voice that we have in terms of raising the plight of the Palestinian people and advocating peace and a settlement there, because I think all of us watch on with horror at the slaughter there day on day. So it's important that we express our desire for our own example to be a shining example in terms of how you can achieve peace. Pat Sheehan. Uh, Thank you, First Minister. Um, would the First Minister agree with me that building and maximising international relations is critically important for growth and prosperity here? Thanks. First Minister. Yes, um, thank you for that. The short answer would obviously be yes. Um, we have enormous um, opportunities now open to us, including the use of dual market access that allow us to grow our exports and attract higher quality foreign direct investment. So we should promote our reputation as a world class destination somewhere to live, work, study and invest. And we're working with our officials now to identify priority areas for international engagement, both thematically and also geographically. And we also then plan to work with our partners right across the globe to promote our international objectives, bringing benefits and prosperity to all of the people that live here. Kate Nichol, question three. Three, please, Mr Speaker. First Minister. With the agreement of the Strategic Planning Group for Refugees and Asylum Seekers, it's um, in short version, the SPG, um, the Department allocated 1.54 million of Home Office full dispersal funding to, lo to local um, councils, which has and continues to be used to support the ongoing development of asylum infrastructure and improve um, services available locally. Home Office has yet to confirm full dispersal funding instructions for the 24-25 financial year, and officials continue to press for urgent clarity on this. The funding quantum is likely to be limited, and whilst we are keen to continue to enhance the support available at local council level, the SPG will need to consider the full range of needs before the allocations will be made. The Department has, however, secured funding from Home Office for refugee employability and integration projects. As such, in the 24-25 financial year, local councils will each receive £50,000 for projects um, to support refugee integration. Salas is a member of the SPG and the Department also chairs a regular council engagement group. Through um, both forums, officials will continue to engage with local councils and also to provide an update when further information on funding is available. Kate Nicholl. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Um, the First Minister will be aware that the Northern Ireland Strategic Partnership um, uh, migration partnership had uh, ceased to exist and TEO has taken the governance um, in, into that department. I have concerns regarding the accountability and the transparency and as dispersal and integration are going to be key roles for so many different departments, would the First Minister commit to looking at this again and how we can ensure that the governance is fully transparent and open? Thank you. First Minister. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I, so, um, like yourself, would share that. I think it's so important that we're joined up, that we're coordinated in that. Um, everybody's working to um, the same plan. So um, work um, in terms of the Strategic Migration Partnership, it did cease to function, as you said, but we've been working with Home Office to cover some of those functions. But I think it's important that we now, that we're up and uh, running again, that we can take a fresh look at that again and just see if there's anything else that we can do to improve how that functions. If it's not the partnership, what does it look like? Um, but happy to continue to engage with the member in that regard. Call Carl McCullion. Uh, 
Tom Colia Ogus, Boy Lumbu Hisahorch, and Kate Ara Sockton Fraga. Um, thank you, First Minister, for your response to Kate Nichols' question. My supplementary would, would be in relation to providing an update as best you can here around the refugee integration strategy and how it fits into everything now. Thank First you. Minister. Thank you. Uh, consultation on the draft strategy ended on the 21st of February in 22, and the analysis showed strong support for the proposed vision and for the outcomes. So work to date has included the establishment of appropriate structures to support an effective and joined-up approach across government, as the previous um, MLA had raised, um, providing support for Ukra Ukrainian arrivals, facilitating the allocation of dispersal funding to enhance local support and services for asylum seekers, implementing regional immigration advice services and developing an orientation package. And then alongside that work, officials have been collaborating with other departments to develop thematic delivery pa plans. And the next step is for officials to bring that final refugee integration strategy and associated plans to the executive for agreement um, in the coming months. Well, Cara Hunter. Speaker, and uh, on the topic of asylum seeking, I know we're all appalled by the uh, murder of thousands of innocent children, men and women, in Palestine. And does the First Minister agree with me that we must step up to the mark and urgently uh, create and commit a Palestinian visa scheme? I think we to need to stay on topic. It's to do with asylum seeking uh, to allow for safe passage for Palestinian uh, people who have family here in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I just think, as, in a, as, a, as a rule, as a society, we should be as open and welcome as we can, particularly for anybody that's fleeing um, persecution or fleeing uh, war-torn um, zones. So, uh, this is something that, again, that we can speak to our officials to make sure that we are as welcoming as we possibly can be, and that we do support people who need our support. I think that's the decent thing to do as any good society. Call Cheryl Brownley. Question four. First Minister. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister Riley will answer this question. On the 6th of August 2020, the Executive formed the Cross Departmental High Street Task Force, chaired by junior ministers. DFC provided the Secretariat. The task force was appointed for five years. Its membership was drawn from a wide range of sectors, including retail, hospitality, academia, central and local government, and the community and voluntary sectors. The task force aim was to deliver the vision of sustainable city, town and village centres, which are thriving places for people to do business, socialise, shop, be creative and use public services, as well as being great places to live. The task force's report, delivered at 21st Century High Street, was submitted uh, in March 2022 to TU, and junior ministers at that time public, publicly accepted the report. High streets are at the heart of our society in more ways than one. They drive, they drive the economy, but they also create shared spaces where society thrives. The task force report was published, as I said, in March 22, <clears throat> um, and as I said, the junior ministers paid tribute to the work done by the task force and welcomed the strategic nar nar narrative. The recommendations will be of interest to a number of government departments. Call Cheryl Brownlee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank you to the junior minister. Um, my constituency encompasses the historical town of Carrick Fergus. Um, a significant part of the high street is within the conservation area. Conservation areas can provide it difficult to implement some of the, the suggestions within the report. Could she detail if there will be any additional support for areas like this to allow them to thrive also? Thank you. Senior Minister Reddick. Um, I'm happy just to come back to the member on that in writing. Philip McGuigan. Good. I can call you and I thank the, the Minister's response uh, to a specific report within the work of the High Street Task Force. If I could maybe ask the Minister just to outline progress to date and taking forward all the work of the High Street Task Force. Here, Mr. Rennick. So, um, the task force, as I said, was established by the last executive. Um, the High Street Task Force was established to look at enhancing investing in cities, towns and villages, which have changed over recent years. The task force uh, worked with relevant departments, businesses, organisations, trade unions, chambers of commerce and local councils to look at the issues affecting high streets and their change in use. Other action um, has been taken in parallel. For example, the Ministerial Advisory Group on Architecture and the Built Environment has developed a fresh approach to placemaking called the Living High Streets. A Living High Streets craft kit is available on the Ministerial Advisory Group website to help local communities develop more sustainable high streets. And under the COVID recovery um, small settlement regeneration programme built upon the successful COVID-19 recovery revitalisation programme. Together, these programmes delivered £40 million of funding to address challenges faced by village, town and city centres. Consideration of the report is a matter for the executive and ministers will shortly write to executive colleagues inviting them to consider how they will take forward the findings of the report. 
Delivering the recommendations will require resources, of course, and that is why we need our public finance on a sustainable footing. And that is the case that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, along with the Finance Minister, will be making directly to the Treasury in the coming period. Hold on, Stuart. Junior Minister for the update on the Manufacturing Task Force. Um, town centres and independent retailers are the backbone of our local economies, Junior Minister. In my constituency of East Antrim, they are now facing a 10 per cent increase in their rates as a result of the striking of the rate. Will the Executive Office commit going forward to look at a rebalancing of how we tax and set rates on our independent retailers so they are not paying the full burden of the rates process? Junior Minister, ready? Yes, yeah, the member will know that that is a local government matter, um, um, but we do acknowledge the vital importance of the hospi hospitality sector in driving people to visit their local high street, particularly as retail habits continue to change. We also recognise the wide range of issues the hospitality sector has faced, including COVID-19 and the cost of living crisis. Hospitality businesses will be a vital part of creating more sustainable high streets, and the recommendations of the report build a strong foundation moving forward. Call Mark Durkin. Question number five. First Minister. In August 20, uh, 2023, TEO notified the Module 2C inquiry team of the potential loss of data from civil service supplied mobile devices to ministers and SPADs that may be relevant to the terms of reference for the public inquiry. The group head of NIC's internal audit service was commissioned to undertake a fact-finding investigation into how some mobile devices returned by ministers and SPADs came to be reset. The report dated 7 December 2023 was shared with the Module 2C legal Team, inquiry legal team um, on the 8th of December. The terms of reference for the next mobile device fact finding investigation stated that if, the, if analysis of the mobile devices by an IT specialist is required to determine the status of each device and retrieve information where possible, that will be undertaken as a separate exercise. On the 20th of December 2023, the head of the civil service commissioned an independent technical analysis of devices that have been allocated to former ministers and special advisors in NICS. The analysis of um, devices is ongoing, and the COVID inquiry will be advised of the final outcome of that exercise. Mr. Durkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. People across the north and beyond were rightly or understandably disturbed that, the, that these WhatsApp messages had been wiped. Does the First Minister regret uh, the deletion of these messages, and will she undertake to change guidance? Uh, for the civil service, so that something like this cannot happen again. First Minister. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the purpose of the whole um, public inquiry is, in fact, to, to learn lessons and make sure that um, any lessons that need to be learned are taken on board and, and never repeated. And I want to be very respectful to the process itself of the independent um, investigation. The inquiry have asked us to do so, but I can assure you that um, any information that is requested of the inquiry, we have um, fully participated in that. Um, I'm glad to say that there's going to be oral hearings held here um, on Module 2C in, in Belfast on the 29th of April, and they're going to run for three weeks. And I just think it's really important that we respect just that process. Um, and in the fullness of time, I've no doubt that we'll come back to this chamber. You ask a question about um, you know, lessons learned. In the first instance, the report and the investigation report will be, uh, has been given to the inquiry. Uh, secondly, then um, they decide just in terms of how, if, if they wish to publish that. Um, but in terms of uh, lessons learned, guidance, I can assure you, has been given to uh, all newly appointed ministers and spads in terms of what is expected. Ms Kimmins. I thank the, minister, the First Minister for her answer so far. Minister, would you agree that this public inquiry is important to address the concerns, particularly for those who have lost loved ones in, during the pandemic, and providing answers for those families should be the primary concern of everyone in this chamber? First Minister. Yes, I mean, absolutely, and I'm sure we all, um, as always, offer our condolences to all those families that lost a loved one. Um, our thoughts are, are with everybody who uh, continues to mourn the loss of someone who they held very dear. So I absolutely agree with the members. This is about um, them, about having their opportunity within the inquiry to examine our response to the pandemic and ensure that lessons them, that are learned for the future are absolutely learned. And it's essential then. Um, that the inquiry has the, the full cooperation of all, and I have no doubt that that is everybody's intention. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, did the Minister ever communicate via WhatsApp in regards to the organisation or arrangements of the funeral of Bobby Story? Mr. Spencer. 
I am going to be respectful of the inquiry and I answer to the inquiry. Uh, and I have appeared before the inquiry and I will do so again. Well, Donnelly, Donnelly. Question six, please, First Minister. Sure. With your permission again, can I call you Junior Minister Riley will answer this question? We are committed to bringing forward the strategic framework for ending violence against women and girls as soon as possible. This is an executive strategy, strategy which has been developed through a successful co-design process involving people and organisations from right across government and society, including crucially those with lived experience. Our officials are liaising with departments and members of the co-design group regarding the outcome of the recent public con consultation. Preparatory work to enable effective delivery is already underway. Uh, and the draft to your implementation plan is being developed for considerations by minister, ministers. The draft strategic framework is expected to be submitted for executive consideration and approval in coming weeks. Um, just also to say that we recognise that there is a lot of work already being taken forward across departments and indeed in our communities. This framework is intended to enhance and complement this work to bring about the changes that we all want to see. In order to tackle violence against women and girls, it is essential that we work in a more strategic and joined up way. Governance structures are being designed to avoid duplication and to maximise the effectiveness of public resources. Close departmental collaboration is ongoing and monitoring will have an outcomes-based focus to ensure effective implementation. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, ministers will be aware that many of these frameworks are rendered subject to budgets. Um, so just to ask, is the Minister satisfied that an adequate budget exists for this work over the time period required? Uh, um, and the member will know that we are operating in a very difficult budgetary situation, um, the impact of which is being felt across all government departments and within our communities. Um, we do acknowledge the continuing good work being carried out by delivery partners in very challenging circumstances. Um, and just to say the work is ongoing to develop an implementation plan to support the delivery of the strategic framework. This includes preparation of a detailed business case to inform ministers, ministerial decisions uh, on associated funding requirements. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to formally congratulate my colleague on her appointment. Uh, Minister, violence against women and girls is a problem that is so widespread in society, and by its very nature, uh, statistics can't properly capture just how big a problem it is. Can you outline everything that your department and yourself are doing to combat this? Minister. Thank the member for her. Thanks for, for the question. Pardon. Work has already been taken forward by the Justice and Health Departments through the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence Strategy by statutory agencies, including the PSNI's Tackling Violence Against Women and Girls Action Plan, and by the voluntary and community sector. Despite this, ending all forms of violence, abuse and harm against women and girls remains one of the most pressing challenges facing our society today. As a response to the last Executive Commission, the development for the strategic framework uh, and work is already underway to establish the foundation for the necessary whole of government and whole of society approach. Engagement with stakeholders across a range of sectors is ongoing, including working together on prevention, across education, in the workplace, when socialising and with our children and young people. This week, Junior Minister Cameron and I, along with senior officials, met with the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, Reem Al Salem. And it was clear from that discussion that to make progress we need to see violence against women and girls is everyone's problem and solving it will require collective action by everyone in society. Thank you. Um, would the junior Minister agree with me that ending violence against women and girls will require buy-in from all departments and that it made absolutely no sense for the Executive Office to consult on this strategy at the same time the Department of Health cut all core grant funding from Women's Aid? And will the Executive Office commit to working with other departments to implement this strategy? Mr. Minister. I thank them for her question. No, not also. Question number seven, please. First Minister. The North West Strategic Growth Partnership continues its work to support the North West region to achieve its full potential and transition to being a net economic contributor. The partnership hosted their most recent plenary meeting on the 30th of November 23. The plenary received updates on various matters including tertiary education and skills, infrastructure and spatial growth and the potential for green growth in the region. A refreshed memorandum of understanding between members of the North West 
tertiary education cluster was also launched at the meeting. This is an, exact, uh, an excellent example of how education providers across both jurisdictions can work together to deliver better services for students. Between September 22 and May of 23, thematic discussions were also facilitated between members of the partnership, and these brought together key players, including the local councils, policy officials from both administrations, and other key stakeholders to have focused conversations across topics, including economic development, further in higher education, tourism and health. And planning is now underway to facilitate further discussions on priority areas in the near future. Ms. Uh, thank you, First Minister, for your answer there. Leadership is really crucial here, and the Executive Office needs to step up uh, and put all support uh, behind the North West Strategic Growth Partnership. Will you commit today to ensuring that your Executive takes this leadership role with the required level of funding allocated to this body to agree uh, a cross border strategic programme to divide growth in the North West cross border city region? First Minister. Yeah, can I just say I think that some of the work that's happened even to this point has been excellent and you can see all the other areas where there's further collaboration that can be achieved and I think that we have to then back that up and I think the fact that we're working across um, both jurisdictions I think it also is equally important in terms of trying to maximise the potential that we know is there. I know just before question time the economy minister took to his feet to set out his economic vision and he also referred to the need for regionally balanced economy and I think that's very, very important when it comes to uh, rebalance and ensuring that the North West um, is part of that plan in terms of expansion, better prosperity for everybody and that everybody enjoys it. Audrey Delarge. Thank the First Minister for her answer. Um, can she also outline any other progress on the North West, please? First Minister. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, there's the city and growth deals um, that are in place for covering Derry City and Strabane Council, Causeway Coast and Glens Council also. And I also understand that Derry City and Strabane Council are currently progressing towards um, signing their deal in spring of summer of this year. Um, and likewise, Causeway Coast and Glens are progressing towards um, signing their heads of terms in spring of this year. So that's um, absolutely good news, no doubt, for the North West. And then with regard to increasing student numbers at McGee, the executive commitment remains a priority. And I understand that the Economy Minister, as I said, will be outlining his plans in relation to that in the weeks ahead. We've got the graduate med medical um, a graduate entry medical school um, opened to its first cohort of students uh, in 21, and with a second and third cohort starting um, over the past two years. And I also understand that the university is also currently developing the business case for the state-of-the-art Northwest Medical School, incorporating graduate entry medical school and personalised medicine. So you can see, um, in terms of the, the progress that's being made and the progress that will be made in the time ahead, it's quite an exciting time in terms of de um, investment in the Northwest. The AFI was obviously going to be key for that um, also, but I think it's important that this executive is seen as a, a champion in terms of regional balance and making sure that we get that right uh, now that we have the opportunity to do so again. Well, Jonathan Buckley. Yep, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Minister. TEO operates under a corporate governance framework. This sets out management responsibilities and the actions the department takes to ensure decisions are open and transparent. The framework covers the principles of good corporate governance and explains the importance placed on policies, plans and review arrangements. It, describes the department's, it prescribes the department's systems of internal control and risk management, along with TEO's internal and external audit arrangements. It is supported by the departmental board's operating framework and by the terms of reference for the Audit and, audit and Risk Assurance Committee and the Major Business Case Committee. Divisions and arm's length bodies provide quarterly assurance statements to confirm that the framework's requirements are being met. The framework is subject to an annual review to ensure it is up to date and responsive to emerging issues. As part of its commitment to transparency, TEO publishes departmental board agendas and minutes of board meetings. The, the department's annual report and accounts contain a governance statement demonstrating the importance of transparency and openness. The decisions taken by departmental officials under the executive formation legislation during the period of suspension of the executive have also been published. One minute for a question and answer. You, the COVID inquiry has, inquiry has rightly raised serious questions surrounding openness and transparency, with former First Minister uh, Nicola Sturgeon from Scotland suggesting it was an all too common use of WhatsApps. With that in mind, can the Minister inform the House, did she supply the inquiry with any WhatsApp messages, both personal or indeed departmental phones? 
As I said um, in an earlier answer, I am going to uh, speak to the COVID inquiry. I mean, that's the forum in which we should address all of these things. I can say that um, we have an investigation underway in terms of how data was wiped from WhatsApp messages or from devices, sorry, in general, in the department. But I also can say that the department did produce more than 290 strings of WhatsApp engagements. But I'm also very certain that uh, policy decisions were not decided by WhatsApp. That would have been through the official channels. Thank you. That's the time for uh, questions. As we move to topical questions, and call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. First Minister, uh, on the day you were inaugurated, uh, I asked you to make a commitment to the people of the North that you and the Deputy First Minister would not resign and collapse uh, these institutions. I followed that up last Sunday with a letter which I haven't ha yet had a response to. First Minister, this isn't a stunt. We've talked today about a whole range of urgent priorities for the people of Northern Ireland. In order to deliver those, we need to have institutions. So will you now commit to not resigning your office for the remainder of this mandate? First Minister. Well, as I've said to the member on each occasion, I'm here because I want to be. Um, I'm here in the executive office, part of the executive, because I want to be and because I want to serve um, all of the people. That's the mandate in which we were all elected um, to serve. I think the, 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 we received your letter. Um, we will respond to you in writing, but I can say that um, this is much bigger than the office of the executive office, because what you're referring to is actually fundamental change, and I think the best place for that is in the political space, and I think the Assembly and Executive Review Committee is probably the best place where that should be taken forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the First Minister that we need to fundamentally reform these institutions based on the rules, but until we do that, only two people yourself and the Deputy First Minister can prevent these institutions collapsing. First Minister, whenever the DUP collapsed this, these institutions, you said it was utterly cruel, contemptible, self-serving. You said it was punishing the public and using our people at ransom, as ransom. You said it threatened our democracy. I agree with you on all those things. So why are you insisting on your party retaining that veto? What, what I'm insisting on is that I am here to do business. I am here to be in the executive. We have chosen to go into the executive and to take the hard decisions and actually um, deal with public services on a day-to-day -day basis. We have taken the pledge of office. We are here to work. And I think that uh, the, the issue that, which the member um, has written to us on I think is more, much more of a political nature and that he should bring it to the executive review committee and, and will not be found wanting in terms of um, engaging in that conversation because we should all be constantly looking at what are the things that actually allow us to work better? What makes us work more effectively? And I'm certainly up for that conversation. Well, Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, First Minister, could you outline your plans to introduce standalone age discrimination legislation for accessing goods, services, and facilities? First Minister. Yeah, um, if I could say the consideration of extending the age discrimination legislation and to the provision of goods, facilities, and services, it was a subject of consultation, as you know, in the previous mandate. And at that time, a decision wasn't made in respect to the scope of the legislation. So I've been told that the issue now requires further work to inform the potential scope of the legislation. And I've, I've no doubt again, like many other things we've talked about here today, there's going to have to come back for more detailed conversation in the Assembly Chamber on these things. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Minister, uh, First Minister, for her answer. Um, she will appreciate that this is the only region of the United Kingdom where we don't have this specific piece of legislation, and the issue seems to be around the lower age limit. Um, but would she agree with me that we need to have this legislation in place, even if that means going with what similarly is done in, in GB and 18 plus? First Minister. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're right because we are the only place on these two islands without any protection um, against age discrimination, um, particularly in provision to goods, facilities, and services. So. I think that we need to look at this urgently and to build on the work that's gone before and actually now um, bring it forward in this mandate. So I look forward to working with the, the member who's shown a keen interest in this in terms of us being able to get to a point where we're all trying to get to. John Buckley. Uh, the 8th of March marks uh, International Women's Day. How much importance does the Minister feel that this day is? First Minister. I'm glad to see that the member has taken an interest in International Women's Day. Um, I hope this year for International Women's Day that we're able to take forward, at least advance our plans around, uh, from the executive's perspective around um, end and violence against women and girls. And I hope that we can get uh, very close to that juncture for our International Women's Day uh, day, uh, because I think this would be a great sign for a wider society and for women and girls out there. This executive has taken that seriously. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On that very day, Operation Canova will report on the actions of the high-profile agent Steakknife. 
Given the abuse, both sexual and otherwise, that many women faced at the hands of paramilitaries, can the Minister inform the House, did she ever meet Freddie Scappatici? First Minister. God bless us and save us. Um, can I say that this has nothing to do with the Executive Office. We will, work our way, we, we will work our way through all of our executive business. The Member may wish to be divisive, and that's, if that's what you wish to do, that's your prerogative. I am committed to working in this joint office. I am committed to trying to do our best around all the issues of public services, and that's what I am focused on. I would even go further than that. I think that's what the wider public are focused on also. Can I please ask the First Minister if her department will bring forward recommendations from the Flags Identity, Culture and Tradition report in this mandate? Yes, um, and can I congratulate the, the member also in her uh, new post of Deputy Chair of the Committee and look forward to working with you. Um, I know you had flagged this is one of the areas that you are keenly interested in. We were able to progress some of this work um, previously and the FICT report was finally presented to the Executive Office back in July of 2020. There's, um, 45, it's quite a comprehensive document, there's 45 recommendations in that um, report. It doesn't provide all the solutions, but it certainly offers us a way forward in terms of how we can um, deal with the issues at the heart of division. Um, it looks at cultural traditions, identities, how they can be celebrated, commemorated. It looks at that whole wide um, area on the basis of equality and mutual respect. So um, what we need to do then is have that full uh, report again brought back to the executive and with what was identified at the time, which would have been an implementation plan for May of this year. Um, and we now need to get the up-to-date position from our officials. And then, again, uh, we will talk to um, probably the committee <coughs> and, and this House, no doubt, a few further occasions. Thank you. I look forward to seeing those plans at the committee. Um, would the First Minister agree with me that instances where um, flags from prescribed organisations that are erected in street furniture with um, the relevant departments or agencies refusing to remove them is completely unacceptable and we need legislation to tackle and regulate this. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think it makes absolute sense for us to get the FICT report published and then move on to whatever legislative changes that we may um, need to make. I think um, there's no doubt that the implementation of the report itself will be challenging, um, but that's why I think we need to have the implementation plan in place. And I want us to get to the point where we have a positive approach um, adopted here towards how we manage the issues of identity and of culture and tradition, um, which continue to cause division. So let's all try to work towards um, legislating where appropriate, but ensuring that we do all of the bit that we can to create an inclusive and a welcoming um, and a multicultural society with anti-sectarianism at its core. You can I ask the First Minister what action the Executive Office is going to take to address silo workings in departments, please? I apologise, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. To ask the First Minister um, what action her department will take to address silo working in departments. I'll, I'll write to the member. Um, do you mean in relation to how everybody's working within their respective departments? I'll talk to you afterwards, perhaps, to get more clarification on what it is that you're asking. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The 17th of February 1978 marked one of the worst atrocities. Um, of the IRA in Northern Ireland. Uh, an incendiary device ripped through um, the Le Mans Hotel. Twelve people were killed, they were burnt alive, um, and dozens were injured. In the interest of reconciliation, will the First Minister condemn the terrorists in the IRA who were responsible for the death and destruction? I think um, the member and myself have discussed uh, areas like this before. I think it's so, so important. I said here two weeks ago when I accepted the position of First Minister that I regret every single loss of life without exception. That's everybody out there who's been hurt in our society. But it's our job together to try to build a better society. It's our job to look towards the future and it's our job to try to properly deal with the past. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I think that the general public are tired of platitudes and they do want to know, in the interest of reconciliation, um, that uh, such atrocities can be condemned wholeheartedly. Let me try another one. Um, Ian Sproul was killed um, by the IRA. Such was the ferocity of the bullets that hit his body. And the IRA later phoned his family and said to go out into the yard and look at the mess that they'd left him. In the interests of reconciliation, 
Will the First Minister condemn such actions and actually go further because there are um, allegations of collusion with the Garda in relation to the death of Ian Sproul? Will the First Minister use her influence to call for an inquiry into such collusion? I think this, this all um, speaks to why we need to properly deal with the past, why we have to have a proper reconciliation process, why we have to properly deal with uh, what was agreed by all parties way back in the Stormont House Agreement. Because what the British government are doing in terms of um, dealing with legacy of the past does nothing to heal anybody's wounds, does not do anything to try to advance our society forward. I'm committed to building a better future. I'm committed to trying to reconcile people. I am committed to doing everything that we can to move our society forward. And no matter who is out there who has been hurt in the past, is not so regrettable across the board. It doesn't matter what background you come from or who hurt who. It is regrettable that there's been any loss of life here on our island. Mike Nesbitt's not in this place. Um, could I call Keith Buchanan? Speaker, uh, First Minister, the attacks on the 7th of October in Israel have started a chain of events we all witness each night on our televisions. Do you condemn that attack of the 7th of October? And I have done so previously. Do you defend the right of Israel to defend itself, or is there no other alternative? This is far too serious for petty games. It's far, far too serious for petty games. What's happening, what's happening in Palestine and the Middle East requires ceasefire, it requires dialogue, it requires all of us to lift our voice to call an end to it. it for all sides, for everybody in the Middle East, they need this to stop. The bombardment every day of the people in Gaza, the Palestinian people, is horrendous and heartbreaking to watch. So we all should be very, very um, conscious of using our voice to call for peace, to call for dialogue, to use our own example that we need to continue to dialogue if we're going to get to a peaceful solution, which is what we all want to see for the people in the Middle East. Call Nicola Brogan. Um, to the First Minister as well. Um, First Minister, the A5 road upgrade is a hugely important um, infrastructure project um, for the people of West Tyrone. Um, would the First Minister join me in welcoming the recent confirmation from the Taoiseach that he intends to bring a proposal to the Cabinet recommending um, an increase in Irish Government's contribution to the A5 project? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, and I know the member is a huge advocate for the A5 and understands the, the the necessity of it and, and also the benefits that it will bring. Um, I really very much welcome Taoiseach's recent commitment in the doll that this is a positive step and the upgrade of the A5 is so crucially important, vitally important in, in fact for the people in the North West. The upgrade is needed, it's going to improve road safety, it's going to enhance our economic development in the area so I look forward to um, in the coming days more positive uh, announcements in terms of the A5 and its contribution to funding. Um, 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 First Minister, the long delay in this project has obviously been hugely frustrating for the many families who have lost um, loved ones on this road and for the many users who know the, the dangers that occur in, in, in using this here dangerous road. Um, does the First Minister agree with me that works need, work needs to begin as soon as possible? First Minister. Yes, and I hope that the work can start very soon now that we have our executive um, back up and running and a minister now at the helm in the department. I think. We all have to maximise um, all of the funding that's available to us and to get this work starting as quickly as possible. And I commend everybody that's been working the Enough is Enough campaign, um, all, the, all the reps who represent um, that part, um, for all the work that they've been doing in terms of getting us to this point. But I hope that we're going to see more positive news in the coming days. That concludes.